started. Students, if you're in the back in the class waiting for a sign-up sheet, please come grab a seat now. Looks like we're just about up, so grab a seat on the floor on the side or in the front here. The sign-up sheet will be there for you when the talk is over at the end, if you didn't get a chance to do it yet. But we're not going to do it while the speaker is coming to the podium. Welcome, everybody. I'm Ben Powell, the director of the Free Market Institute here at Texas Tech University. Uh, we were founded in 2013, which means this spring we're coming up on our 10-year anniversary. Uh, pretty soon we'll have some announcements out about 10-year anniversary public events that we're going to be doing uh, throughout the course of the spring semester. Uh, but before I can tell you about those, at another talk later this semester, I do want to quickly preview our next couple coming up, take care of one other thing, and then I'll get our speaker introduced. So, next up this semester on a timely topic, how the Fed failed to achieve its mandate, Tom Hogan, an economist with the American Institute for Economic Research, will be here talking about inflation, monetary policy, and how the government's screwing things up on us right now. Next up, that'll be on Tuesday, October 11th. Next up after that, Jim Otteson, a professor from Notre Dame, will be here talking about his book, Honorable Business, a Framework for Business in a Just and Humane Society. That'll be on Tuesday, November 1st, this semester. And one other thing before I introduce uh, Professor Coyne, uh, myself and the other faculty members of the Free Market Institute are often the, the public face of the Institute who are up here introducing people but giving our own talks, being in the media, etc. But we have a fantastic staff at the Institute who makes all of this program impossible. And I want to recognize one of them today. Uh, Amanda Smith, will you come up here please? Uh, our administrator for student and public programming, which means all these public lectures that you come to. It's Amanda who's doing the legwork, a lot of the legwork behind making them happen. And she has been with Texas Tech five years at the start of this semester. So to recognize her five years of service with the Free Market Institute, a little token of appreciation. Thank you. All right, now it's my pleasure to briefly introduce our speaker tonight. Chris Coyne is a professor of economics at George Mason University and the associate director of the F.A. Hyatt Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center. He also earned his PhD from George Mason University, where, 20 years ago, we were classmates and arguing together in other people's economics classes. So it's a thrill to have him back here. He has visited Texas Tech before. Uh, Chris is a prolific scholar. He's authored more than 100 scholarly journal articles and six books. His work's been cited more than 6,000 times by other scholars doing their own research. Uh, his most recent book that's due out just in a couple months, we we're originally hoping he was going to be able to talk about that, but the book's not quite out yet, is called In Search of Monsters to Destroy, The Folly of American Empire and Paths to Peace, uh, which will be out this November. And he's actually doing double duty for us. He's here this weekend to meet with our student reading group, uh, who spent some of the semester reading his book, Doing Bad by Doing Good, uh, How Humanitarian Action Fails. But tonight, he's going to be talking about his 2021 book, Manufacturing Militism, U.S. Government Propaganda in the War on Terror, which conveniently, when I brought him to campus today, <laughs> Texas Tech parked a helicopter right outside of the Free Market Institute's building. So Chris got his guns up with the guns on the helicopter and uh, is now here to Unmet, unmanufacture some militarism with us tonight. Chris, welcome. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming this evening. Uh, and uh, I'm going to get right to it because we don't have much time and I, I want to cover some uh, material with you that I, I hope you'll find useful. Uh, certainly for the, the students and those who are taking economics classes. I hope to, among other things, provide you some insight into the widespread applicability and relevance of the economic way of thinking. Uh, and for those of you who uh, either don't study economics or are, are here uh, out of general interest, I hope to impress upon you uh, some useful ideas that you can appreciate as a uh, member of a society and a member of a society that presumably you want to be free, uh, both for you and for your fellow human beings. Uh, and so what I'm about to talk about is uh, central to that, and I'll try to make clear why. As Ben mentioned, this draws upon a book uh, titled Manufactured Militarism, and I do want to mention my co-author. Uh, her name's Abigail Hall. She's a professor of economics at, at the University of Tampa, uh, and she was uh, crucial in uh, writing this book. 
Uh, and so, let me begin with a political commentator named H.L. Mencken. Uh, and Mencken uh, was wonderful, wonderful writer. If, you, if you've never come across his work, I highly recommend looking it up, or at least looking up some of the quotes from it. He was extremely witty, uh, funny, and insightful uh, on uh, a variety of, of topics. And I think, uh, even though he was writing uh, in the early 1900s, I think a lot of what he wrote was relevant for today. And so let me start with this quote from Mencken from 1918. Uh, the whole aim of practical politics is to keep the populace alarmed, and hence clamorous to be led to safety by an endless series of hobgoblins, most of them imaginary. And what I want to suggest for the purposes of our discussion this evening is that uh, Mencken was correct. And I want to focus on one particular set of often imaginary threats, and that is threats related to national security. And I want to focus on uh, the aim of practical politics as it pertains to national security, uh, which to my way of thinking is to keep us, the populace, uh, scared and subservient uh, to our political masters. And uh, uh, propaganda is one way of doing that. So let me, before I go on, tell you what I hope to, to do, to, to kind of orient you. So if, if, if you said to me, well, what are the key points? What are the takeaways here? Where do you hope that we end up? Here's how I would summarize it. Number one, all governments employ propaganda. All governments. We tend to think about propaganda being utilized as a tool by authoritarian or totalitarian regimes. And that's certainly correct. But democratic governments have historically and do currently utilize propaganda. Number two, propaganda is especially prevalent when it comes to matters of national security and war. Number three, war-related propaganda has pernicious, pernicious effects on freedom and liberty and threatens the foundations of a self-governing society. And I hope to, to make clear why, why you should care about it. So those are kind of the main takeaways that I, that I hope I'll be able to uh, introduce you to. In terms of how, how I'm going to proceed, I'm going to proceed in three steps. I'm going to provide what I call the foundations. So I'll define some key terms and provide some foundational concepts. I'll talk about some manifestations of the concepts that I talk about, <coughs> mainly focused on post 9-11 war on terror, but I'll, I'll also highlight some other historical instances along the way, both in imagery and in terms of some uh, evidence. Uh, and then I'll talk about therapeutics. Uh, that is, given the threat that propaganda poses to a free society, what if anything can be done? And then hopefully we'll have some time for some Q&A. So let's get right into it. What's propaganda? Uh, well, uh, propaganda has a negative connotation, of course, as a term. It didn't always, by the way, but originally the term meant to spread one's opinion, and it was neutral. Uh, but it was really in the early 1900s that it began to take on a negative connotation, a negative political connotation, which really came into its own during the World Wars. Uh, and the way that my co-author and I delineate what is propaganda and what is not is to start very broad and then drill down to a couple of defining features. And so in the broadest sense, the way we view propaganda is as information that is intended to shape the views of the recipients. To shape the views of recipients in a way that aligns their beliefs, expectations, and actions with the goals of the propagandist. To provide a, a little bit more meat to the bones, the, the defining elements from our perspective are that propaganda is false, purposely false or biased. It's used to promote a political cause, and it's bad from the recipient's perspective because it prevents the recipient from having information that otherwise could be available that would empower them to make a more informed decision. Now, one of the most common questions I get when I talk about this is, well, isn't this just advertising? What's the dis differentiation between advertising and propaganda? And we can talk more about this, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it at a few, few words for now and what I think is the most salient difference between the two. Advertising attempts to inform us as consumers about alternatives. My iPad is superior to the other products being offered to you. And I need to convince you of that as a consumer in order for you to turn over your hard-earned dollars to me as compared to an alternative supplier. So advertising communicates information about alternatives that are available. Propaganda does the opposite. Propaganda is meant to close off alternatives. It is meant to make the recipients believe that if you do not fall in line 
if you don't do what you're supposed to do, uh, horror will fall, be, 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 befall you. Uh, as this image from World War II uh, tries to communicate, uh, if, we, if you don't buy war bonds, if you don't support the war effort, uh, your, your innocent little child uh, is going to become a Nazi. Uh, and uh, what's this trying to do? Close off substitutes. There's no other alternative other than to support the war effort. So that's the defining feature from our perspective. What are the functions of propaganda? Well, there's three main ones I want to highlight for the purpose of, as a purpose of our discussion this evening. Anytime you have what economists call a, a coordination problem, which is you need to coordinate a large number of people around a certain outcome where there's multiple possible alternative strategies or, or, or uh, uh, outcomes that you could pursue, uh, it's important to create what's called common knowledge. And common knowledge is really expectations about what other people are going to do. Because if you can have feasible expectations about what other people are going to do, you can then undertake actions to coordinate with them. And so, uh, how does this play out in terms of propaganda? Uh, well, one of the, the, the genius uh, aspects of, of effective propaganda is that it effectively disarms criticism of governments. And the way that it disarms criticisms of governments is by creating a set of expectations that is unpatriotic to question what government is doing. That is, if the propagandist can create effective expectations that you voicing displeasure at what your government is doing makes you unpatriotic, it makes you supportive of the enemy, and so on, then you are less likely to voice criticism because of the social punishment that will be bestowed upon you. Uh, propaganda attempts to transmit information. War is extremely costly, both in terms of monetary outlays in the immediate term, both in terms of life and limb, but also in terms of development and economic well-being. Uh, eco uh, war impoverishes people. Uh, and this was evident during the world wars, uh, when, of course, uh, the US government turned to uh, the socialist means of economic production. Amongst them, a rationing system, where people would receive coupons and be allotted a certain amount of items. And as the uh, top propaganda poster indicates, I am patriotic, uh, so uh, I'm as patriotic as can be, and ration points won't worry me. I'm going to have to sacrifice the well-being of myself and my family, but it's OK, because I'm a patriot. Somehow implying that if you were unhappy with being impoverished due to the war effort, and you, uh, uh, it should make you feel guilty for not being patriotic uh, and uh, attempting to disin disincentivize voicing dissatisfaction with that. And of course, the third one is fear monger, which is that propaganda aims to instill fear in the recipients. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, plenty of imagery out of World War II is precisely that. We saw one a moment ago, and here's another one. Uh, if you don't, again, invest in war bonds, uh, I guess in not investing in war bonds is the most dangerous thing that could happen during this period, apparently. But in any case, the, the enemy is going to show up and kill you and your family. So that's the functions of propaganda. What are the techniques? If you look across instances of propaganda, across government use, there are some common techniques that come to the forefront. Number one, appeal to authority. So there's an authority that is speaking down to the populace for their own good. Uh, in uh, the United States, at least historically, this is illustrated with a variety of official seals, endorsements by members of the political elite, and so on, which is meant to give legitimacy to the message that is being communicated. Uh, appeal to patriotism. We've already seen several instances of that. Uh, this, again, is the perhaps most effective way uh, to convince people to fall in line, uh, is to uh, threaten them as being deemed to be unpatriotic. Uh, is somehow not supporting their government, their country, the members of the military, uh, and in turn supporting uh, the enemy and all the threats they're in. The other techniques that are involved in propaganda is very clear distinctions. Uh, there's no room for nuance or complexities when it comes to com uh, propaganda. It's, it's very distinct. It's us versus them. There's the good people and the bad people. Uh, and. Uh, uh, this makes it very clear to the recipient, uh, not just of the threat being posed, but of 
the threat being posed typically by a collective. During World War II, the Japanese were the bad people. Uh, as if that's some <coughs> unitary whole, instead of a collection of actual individuals, human beings. Which is very easy to forget when it comes to matters of national security and war. That is, we're talking about people, not collectives. Of course, there's an irony, oftentimes overlooked in adopting collectivism in the name of promoting liberalism and individual freedom. But that is what war is, is collectivism writ large. The final propaganda is simple slogans. Simple slogans that mean everything and nothing. Here's one, which I saw multiple times on my way here from Virginia. Support the troops. It sounds nice. Who doesn't want to support the troops? What does that mean? What does it mean to support the troops? Presumably, it means something like you support anything the troops are told to do. Perhaps, but the, part, the, the potential problem with that is that what the troops are being told to do may not be in their best interest, let alone in your best interest, of a member of the populace which those troops and the political elite that control them represent. And so you see these kind of cheap taglines, salute to service, shock and awe, mission accomplished. Again, they all sound nice. They're meant to evoke some kind of emotion. But if you actually think about it, uh, these, these phrases mean uh, uh, nothing because they're so broad, uh, they actually have no analytic tractability in the actual world without adding any kind of content to them. The purpose of them, I would submit, is to disincentivize you from doing that. So what are the justifications for propaganda? There's many. But there's two that I want to highlight tonight because they are two I most com commonly hear. <coughs> you know, there's a famous movie, now it's a classic, amongst the, the kids. <coughs> it's called A Few Good Men. It came out in the early 90s. All right? Tom Cruise, Jack Nicholson, uh, Demi Moore is in it. In any case, uh, Jack Nicholson uh, plays a high-ranking military official involved in a cover-up and uh, he is being interrogated in court by Tom Cruise, and at the end of the movie, at the, I'm giving it away because you probably won't watch it anyway, at the end of the movie, kind of the climax of the movie, Tom Cruise makes him snap, and, 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 and he starts screaming at Tom Cruise, and he says, you can't handle the truth. And what he's implying is that there are th uh, there's ugliness in the world such that you don't want to deal with it in your pristine little life, so you leave that to the elite who deal with those messy matters. And so we isolate and insulate the general populace from that. And this is one of the most common justifications for the use of propaganda. That is that the political elite should lie to the populace in the name of the good of the populace. They're doing it for benevolent and, and noble reasons, which is they can clean up the messes in the world and you don't, and I don't have to worry about it. Let me give you the second justification. I'll come back and, and explain to you why I found these problematic or at least insufficient by their own. <clears throat> There's a famous philosopher by the name of Hannah Arendt that some of you might have he heard of. If not, uh, I suggest at some point in your life uh, looking into her work. It's, uh, parts of it are quite good. Uh, but she wrote a wonderful piece in the uh, New York Review of Books uh, in the 70s in the wake of the release of the Pentagon Papers. All right, and, and the Pentagon Papers, for, for people here who don't know, uh, you should. Uh, and especially now with uh, the memorial that's outside not too far from here, it's particularly relevant. The Pentagon Papers are one of the most uh, important historical episodes in American history, and cert certainly in contemporary times. What the Pentagon Papers are, are a collection of papers that was written by the US government, but that was leaked to the press by a whistleblower named uh, Daniel Ellsberg, who, by the way, is a, a famous economist prior, prior to being a whistleblower. And what the Pentagon Papers revealed was that the US government had systematically lied to the populace about what they were doing in Vietnam and about the status of the war. That's important in itself, but the other reason that the Pentagon Papers are relevant for American history is that it led to one of the most famous Supreme Court cases, the New York Times versus the United States in 1971, about free speech. 
because the Nixon administration attempted to block the New York Times and other uh, uh, media outlets from publishing the Pentagon Papers in the name of national security. This went to the courts, high courts, Supreme Court, and they found in favor uh, of the New York Times. So the New York Times was able to publish the papers. Uh, and uh, what Hannah Arendt points out is that this had nothing at all to do with protecting national secrets from enemies, which is the second justification, is that government needs to lie as a sort of misdirection. That is, we need to keep our enemies on, on their toes. So if we're revealing some information that's truthful and some that's untruthful, that the enemy won't know what's going on and will trick them. But that requires that propaganda is directed at the enemy. And if you look at it, not always, but quite often, propaganda is not directed abroad, it's directed domestically. As Hannah Arendt correctly points out, in my view, in the case of the Pentagon Papers, they were directed at the American populace and Congress to deceive them so that the members of the national security elite could carry out their plans without checks and balances on their behavior. You can hopefully already start to see how this is problematic when it comes to the foundations of a free society, which is one of the key aspects of a free society is checks on political opportunism, on abuses of power. And so when steps are actively taken to remove those checks, you can see how it would be problematic. So then why does this happen? Well, number one, because we, the people, let it happen. The, I'm going to come back and talk about this in a little bit. The source of government power in all societies, from totalitarian societies to societies that are fortunate enough to live under more uh, uh, limited governments, uh, is the citizenry. Enough of the citizenry must buy in, either through indifference, through apathy, or through active acceptance, and in some cases, parentalism, that is, demanding that the government treats them as a child, in order for government to do things. And that's what sets all this up, is that citizens are open to it. But the other thing that sets it up is what economists call information asymmetries. Information asymmetries are simply the idea that parties have different information. Symmetric would be the same. Asymmetric, different. Asymmetric information in itself is not problematic. It, it, it's ubiquitous. It's all around us in our personal relationships, in our purchasing relationships, in markets, and so on, and in our interactions with government. But there's something unique about the national security state, which is if you actually sit down and study it, rather than just take it for granted and pretend that everything they're doing is to protect us, you start to realize that something is amiss. And what you start to realize in the United States is that the size and the, the, uh, so the, the scale size and scope, breadth of the national security state is enormous, uh, such that you can't keep track of it. Uh, we know this from a uh, wonderful study by, done by two journalists, uh, Dana Priest and William Arkin. They originally published this study in the Washington Post and then published a book called Top Secret America. And in the wake of the 9-11 attacks and the onset of the war on terror, the US government expanded massively. It injected an enormous amount of money which attracted military contractors uh, like bees are attracted to honey. And uh, what that did is dramatically expand the number of people that have uh, security clearance. Uh, and what Arkin and Priest attempted to do is to uh, map out, not to pass judgment, simply to map out this thing we call the national security state. And they couldn't do it. They could not map out all the different layers. So that's the breadth of it. What about the scale in terms of expenditures? Well, you may or may not be familiar with this, but you should be if you care about uh, fiscal policy, which is there is uh, one federal bureau uh, or agency that has consistently violated federal law uh, since uh, the late 90s. Uh, well, there's numerous, but on the one mark I'm talking about. <laughs> which is that Bill Clinton, uh, during the Clinton administration, he passed a law that required the major federal agencies to meet basic auditing. Guidelines, just like we would expect any private firm to do. Uh, seems reasonable, doesn't seem crazy that we should expect the caretakers of our resources that, who are supposed to be public servants to meet basic accounting standards. There is one bureau that has uh, basically uh, uh, refused to even submit to an audit, uh, 
uh, which is the Pentagon. Uh, and the Pentagon actually submitted finally to an audit about, I think, two or three years ago, uh, which they failed miserably. Uh, but of course, then they patted themselves on the back and said, well, at least we submitted to it finally. Uh, and uh, again, if any private actor said this to the IRS, uh, they would be fined at best, if not thrown into a cage. Uh, but uh, the, the Pentagon is met with increasingly increased budgets uh, and cheers from uh, both sides of the political aisle. Uh, and so why is this problematic? You have a massive bureaucratic apparatus with an enormous amount of resources, very little accountability. There's not competition. Not domestic, at least, because the federal government carries out foreign policy and has a monopoly on the provision of national security. So there's not the competitive checks like there is in markets or at state level governments across services. And so you get massive amounts of waste, massive amounts of fraud, and massive amounts of lying. With very little ability to check, you say, well, what about congressional oversight? Well, the problem with congressional oversight is that the members of congressional oversight committees typically rely on members of the national security state to provide them with information to monitor what they're doing, which allows then members of the national security state to strategically present information, withhold information, and so on, which undermines the very point of the check. The other problem here is that the U.S. government's classification system is expensive. And history demonstrates why. Uh, in the, uh, uh, during the, the World Wars and then into the Cold War, the concern at the time was that national security secrets were going to end up in the hands of enemies. That's not crazy. So what was the response to that? We are going to, we being the, the, the uh, national security state, is going to uh, impose an uh, uh, expansive classification system that allows people to mark things as state secrets, which limits who can have access to them. Of course, we're seeing this right now with all the Trump stuff going on, by the way, about clearances. That's all links back to the, the classification system. And uh, of course, when you allow people to classify things and then prevent other people from seeing them, the incentive is to classify as compared to not classify. And for decades, uh, we have known that over, over classification takes place because our own government tells us. Starting in the late 50s, uh, there was a committee on, on that reviewed classification, and I have a few quotes here. Uh, which I won't read to you since you can read them yourself, uh, but this is 1956 and they're already saying that overclassification is uh, uh, expensive. Uh, and it's only gotten worse. Uh, and uh, the problem being that when uh, members of government can utilize this, it insulates them from oversight, certainly by the citizenry, but also from members of Congress and so on. Uh, and uh, you might say, well, that's good when it comes to national security secrets proper, uh, but we know, again, from the various committees, which Abby and I document in the book, all the different committees that have gone through and uh, concluded that there's ma major overclassification, that a significant amount of what's classified has nothing at all to do with national security. Uh, meaning that if you declassified it, it would not threaten national security in any way. It wouldn't make certain people look bad, which is why they don't want it declassified. So how do we see this in practice? Let me run through a couple illustrations for you. Uh, number one, lie to drum up support. Uh, the George W. Bush administration, in the wake of 9-11, uh, lied consistently and systematically. They lied about connections between Saddam Hussein's regime and Al-Qaeda. They lied about the presence of weapons of mass destruction possessed by Saddam Hussein and so on. Uh, and we know this. Uh, this one study by the Center for Public Integrity uh, finds hundreds of cases of <coughs> inaccurate statements made to the, the polity, the general populace, to convince people to support the war effort. Of course, the culmination of this is Secretary of State Powell's famous address to the United Nations in 2003 where he went before the international community to make the case that Iraq was a threat because of its connections to terrorism, because of its connections to weapons of mass destruction, which aimed to gain international support for invasion and occupation. Powell considered this one of the, if not the, greatest regret of his career. Uh, but he also attempted to pass blame. And he said, look, I was just doing my job. They had already decided to go to war. My job was to convince people that they should go to war too. Uh, 
that's the nice way of putting it, convince people. An alternative way of putting it is lie. It's to lie to both the American populace and to uh, the uh, uh, broader community. Now, why does all this matter before I go on? Here's why it matters. Totalitarian regimes, it's not that interesting that they lie. That's what they do. That's why they're authoritarian despots. They're terrible governments from the standpoint of the citizenry. We tend to hold democratic systems in a different regard. Why? Well, at least in principle, democratic societies operate in the following manner. Where a totalitarian regime operates in a manner where the political elite look down upon the people, the citizenry, where they control them, democracies are supposed to flip that over. So there's a reason we refer to the political uh, representatives that we elect as public servants. They are supposed to serve. Who do they serve? The populace. So in a democratic system, at least conceptually, not always in practice, often not in practice, the driving force of decision making is supposed to be the citizens. That is, the political elite derive their mandate to have positions of power and are supposed to engage in actions that represent the interests of the citizenry. What does propaganda do? It flips that over. If I say, well, I'm going to lie for your own good, that's the, you can't handle the truth. That means you can't handle being a citizen. You can't handle what it takes to engage in self-governance to communicate your preferences. Also understand, because some of you might say, well, I, I get it, but in times of crisis, we need to do that. You open the door to those two justifications, the game is over. Why? Well, you say, when it comes to war, we can't trust the people, so we need to defer to experts. Okay, how many of you are experts on exotic financial products, like derivatives, swaps, short selling, and so on? Maybe some of you. I'm guessing not most of you. So now I can say, well, I can't trust you to control your finances. We need the experts to do it. I say, how many of you are medical doctors who are experts when it comes to health care? Again, there might be some of you here who do have that background. Most of us do not. It's very easy to say, well, I need to lie to people to get them to do what I want because it's for their own good. And you say, that could never happen. I say, yes, it could. Just look at COVID. So you start opening the door to government lying in the name of the common good. There's no end in sight. You are simply leaving up to the discretion of those that are in charge to determine what you are able to do and not, which again flips over the logic of the source of political power in a free society. So returning to this, you say, okay, that's Iraq, what about Afghanistan? I say, don't worry, the US government's got you covered. There's a wonderful project, uh, it's, it's depressing, but it's wonderful in terms of pulling back the curtain on how this system actually operates. It's called the Afghanistan Papers. It's uh, undertaken by a journalist named Craig Whitlock, he originally published the Afghanistan papers at the Washington Post. They're open access, so any of you can just go on the website and look at them. And then he wrote a book where he included all the Afghanistan papers, but he wrote them out as a narrative that, that flow logically so you can follow what was going on in Afghanistan. The Afghanistan papers uh, are a collection of uh, uh, reports by the Special Inspector General uh, for the Afghanistan Reconstruction. So that was the agency that was uh, tasked with overseeing the US occupation of Afghanistan and uh, memos uh, both to and from then Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld about the Afghanistan war. Uh, and uh, you read through this stuff, uh, and again, you see systematic lying by the US government to the American populace about what's going on in Afghanistan. It's bipartisan. It's not the Republicans doing it. It's not just the Democrats doing it. It's multiple presidential administrations uh, uh, both the, the members of the presidential administrations and the members of the military. Uh, so here are some, some select quotes. Uh, one person interviewed said, look, we didn't know what we were doing. Now go look, which look Whitlock uh, uh, captures in his book, and public speeches are taking place where it's, we're winning the war in Afghanistan, we've got this covered, everything's going great, we won't be there that much longer. And the reality behind the scenes is it was uh, outright dysfunction. Now, uh, this person being interviewed highlights the 2,400 lives lost. That's Americans, which is a very American-centric thing to do. Uh, the reality is that uh, in Afghanistan, our best estimates of uh, uh, people uh, killed are in the uh, hundreds of thousands. Uh, 
uh, whether it's two, three, or 400,000, that we don't have as good an estimate on. Uh, but I like to mention that as well, uh, because as I mentioned earlier, uh, there's a tendency when it comes to war to uh, uh, engage in uh, holism, nation states. It's, it's the United States versus Afghanistan. Uh, but these are human beings we're dealing with, uh, uh, actual human beings. They may not look like us. Uh, they may not have the same skin color as us. They may not talk like us or have the same religion as us, but they're human beings. Uh, and to the extent that you are concerned with uh, uh, the well-being of human beings, which I would submit is quite an important value to hold, uh, this should concern you. Uh, and so hundreds of thousands of people died because of lies. When you are outside a memorial circle looking at the wall, so in Vietnam, if I remember correctly, just Americans, around 60,000 killed, about 2,000 missing in action, if I remember correctly. All right? So, you should get emotional about that. Those are human lives. But don't forget the source of it. That didn't have to happen. War is a choice. It is not a predetermined outcome. But then the question is, who is going to make the choice? There's a difference, by the way, between supporting the troops and supporting those who make decisions about how troops' lives are allocated. And those are different things. So to my way of thinking, supporting the troops, or what I'll call being patriotic, requires not a blind acceptance of the dictates of our political masters, but a critical skepticism of those very people, precisely because what is at stake? Precisely because we care about the troops. And so one of the things I want to be very clear about is that patriotism is not, and never has been, in a free society, blind acceptance of what government tells us. It's the exact opposite. There's an important distinction between country and government. A country, to my way of thinking, is a set of values and beliefs that broadly describe some collection of people within some geographic space. That's country. Government is the apparatus of coercion and force that operates within a country. Now it is possible that the operations of a government might be in line with the values, the interests of those that constitute the country, and so on. But it's also possible that those things might be at odds. Where they are at odds, that is, where members of the government are doing things that are fundamentally at odds with the country and what that represents broadly understood, you need some mechanism, presumably, to check it. Of course, people have realized this for centuries political philosophers at least, which is why we talk about things like the paradox of government. How do you empower government to do things but constrain them from abusing that power? That's why we talk about the importance of constitutions, because that is one potential mechanism for limiting political opportunism. And so, some more insights from the Afghanistan papers. The metrics that were being presented to members of the polity were made up. They were just made up. They were, people were picking and choosing metrics that made the war effort look good and presenting them as if they were fact and as, the, as if they were evidence that things were going well. Trillions of dollars, hundreds of thousands of lives lost. So you have to ask yourself, did it have to be that way? John Shapko was the uh, Special Inspector General for Afghan the Afghanistan Reconstruction. So he, had, he oversaw that office. And he testified in front of Congress in the wake of the release of the Afghanistan papers. Uh, and as he pointed out, there was a systematic line uh, to the American populace. Uh, in some sense, for those of you who know your history, uh, none of this is shocking. Uh, because throughout US history, from the earliest days of the Republic, when war was undertaken, lies were told. Uh, and through time, uh, uh, that has only escalated. Uh, the, the magnitude and extent of those lies has, has increased. What else? Capture the media. We like to pretend in America that we have a free media. Uh, 
Uh, on many marches we do, by the way. So I don't mean to sound flippant when I say we pretend. But we also we do pretend that the media is somehow isolated and, and independent from government. Uh, and uh, it's not, especially when it comes to matters of national security and war. Uh, and uh, again, this has happened throughout history. During the World Wars, the US government was quite blatant about this. They were quite blatant about providing information to journalists about propaganda. Uh, there's things like Operation Mockingbird, where the US government basically had hundreds of journalists on their payroll and were paying them to write stories in support of war efforts. Uh, things aren't as blunt now, uh, but it still happens. So the Bush administration came up with a very clever way of doing this. They would provide talking points to uh, experts who had relationships with the Pentagon. Those experts would go on TV, say those talking points, and then members of the Bush administration would quote those talking points back and say, see, the experts said this, uh, and they wrote them in the first place. And they would use that as evidence of, of the strategies they were taking, uh, undertaking, uh, of the uh, 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 status of the war in Afghanistan uh, to, to maintain support. This neuters the media as a check on government. One of the key benefits of media, not the only role for media, part of it is entertainment, of course. It's nice to have free media that can provide us goods and services for, for art and entertainment. But part of the, the key role of free media is to check government abuse, which is why in totalitarian societies, when there's a coup, what is one of the first things they do, if not the first thing? They take over the media. Why? Because you can broadcast an enormous amount of information to a large number of people. And when you control that, you control the ability to influence what people are thinking about, what they're not thinking about, but also pushing substitutions and alternatives off the table. Threat inflation. Members of the national security state love to inflate threats. This goes back to the Mencken quote at the beginning. And it's their incentive to do so, because of course that's what drives them. So here's a TSA poster. Looks nice, there's an innocent girl in black and white. She's pledging allegiance. Do you remember how it felt to feel safe? All right, back in Pleasantville, before the world got colorful, <laughs> and we lost our innocence. Uh, and to the well-informed citizen, you say, of course I remember how it is to feel safe, because I was alive five minutes ago. Uh, and uh, uh, I was extremely safe then. Uh, and uh, I'm safe today. Uh, and uh, this is statistically true. Uh, this is not uh, uh, me speculating. Uh, there's a political scientist named by the name of John Mueller. He's retired now, but he was at Ohio State for his career. And he's co authored numerous books by, with a statistician named uh, Mark Stewart. And they have documented these statistics as it pertains to the risk associated with terrorist threats. And even if you include 9-11, which if you were actually doing an analysis, you would drop out because it's considered an outlier. It's an extreme instance that skews the data set because that's not the norm. But we can include it for the sake of discussion. You have a greater chance of dying from a car accident, certainly, but from even more extreme events like a deer running across the street while you're driving, lightning hitting you, peanut allergies, drowning in a bathtub. These are all risks that we accept on a daily basis, and we don't think about them. The government utilizes the extreme, and terrible, by the way, because admitting reality does not mean you have to forego the, the, the horribleness of terrorist attacks like the 9-11 attacks, but they use that to scare people into thinking that somehow those threats are all around us. And in fact, they make people less safe. Here's how. You raise the cost of flying by raising the cost of going through security. I'm not necessarily talking about monetary price, even though they did tack on the cost of the TSA as well to tickets, just in terms of time. What do people do on the margin? They substitute into driving. Driving a car is infinitely more dangerous than flying on a plane in general, and infinitely more dangerous than dying in a terrorist act. So to the extent that increased security raised the cost of flying, pushed people, even if it's a few on the margin, to driving, it increased the chance of road accidents and made people less safe. I'm ending in 15 minutes, so I'm going to skip a little bit to the conclusion, because I want to leave some time to speak with you. So where do we leave? What, what are we to do? All right, and, and I have no silver bullet, no one does. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna I, know how, I know what we need to do in the broadest sense. There's a wedge. What's the wedge? The wedge is between members of the political elite, the national security state, and citizens. That wedge is driven by information asymmetries, by our inability to discern truth-telling 
from lying. That's the wedge. Again, in an ideal world, in a democracy, you have citizens who communicate their preferences to their representatives and their representatives do what they want. But there's frictions in the political process, and those are magnified in the national security state for the reasons I mentioned earlier. So anything that narrows that wedge, presumably, will move us towards being able to better discern truth from lie. So what might some potential solutions be? One might be self-restraint by members of the national security state. That is, we bank on them being good people. Now, that's certainly possible, and I'm sure some of them are good people. But we know empirically that at least a segment of them lie. And lie dramatically, with significant consequences. And so, leaving people up to their own devices uh, to check themselves, uh, from my perspective, is problematic. Then we have Congress. Uh, and of course, as I mentioned, Congress also fall, falls prey to information asymmetries. But the other thing, at least in the United States, is that Congress long ago gave up their, uh, their constitutional duties to effectively check the executive branch when it comes to war-making abilities. It's in the Constitution, by the way, in order to do what? Separate powers. Because the founders did not want centralized power for war-making in the hands of just the executive branch because they could abuse the power. So they said Congress needs to check them through the authorization of war. And this just doesn't happen. And even when things happen, they're fake and broad. Authorization for the use of force. It's so broad it means anything. You're not checking government in any way. You're basically giving them a blank check. That, of course, is what happened in the wake of 9-11. So congressional oversight, we can wish, but I'm not too confident. Whistleblowers. Now, whistleblowers, uh, at least those that operate outside government, tend to generate very bimodal reactions. People either think they're heroes or the worst people in the world. And of course, governments invest a lot of time convincing us that whistleblowers are the worst people in the world, that they have blood in their hand, on their hands and so on. Uh, and perhaps some of them do, uh, but many of them don't. Uh, and that is government uh, uh, invest resources in doing that uh, because they are embarrassed and because they realize that people are going to realize what they've been doing. The Pentagon Papers I mentioned earlier being one example, uh, and there's more contemporary examples as well. So whistleblowers might play an important role. Uh, but there's one final thing I want to mention in, in my closing few minutes here, which is step back for a moment and ask yourself, why do governments invest so much, so much in propagandizing people? Why do they invest so much in shaping and providing information and trying to frame information and shift the frame of what is tolerable to people, both under authoritarian governments, but also in democracies. To my way of thinking, the reason they do it is because you and I possess a significant amount of power over them. We have just been indoctrinated from a young age to think we don't, or we don't care to recognize the power that we have over them. As I mentioned earlier, even the most totalitarian governments rely on enough of the citizenry being apathetic or passive to their power. And they set up an entire apparatus to do that. Some of that is based on brute force, secret police forces, and so on. Much of it is based, is based on expectation <coughs> and fear. So what one of the things that totalitarian regimes do historically, they set up private surveillance. Family members monitor other members of their families and friends, and you worry about people ratting you out for deviating from the dictates of the political elite and turning you into the authorities. And if you create enough fear, you can get people to go around, uh, go along. And even if people strongly dislike you because people are afraid to voice it. So that's the fascinating thing with when revolutions happen. You get enough common knowledge to get a tipping point where people are unhappy with the regime, but they're able to act in concert with enough strength to overturn government. And government does not have enough power, enough brute force, when enough people push back against them, to do anything about it. So you and I have a significant amount of power. Now the question is, how do you want to exercise that? And that's up to you. I can't tell you that. But I will leave you where I started with a subsequent quote from H.L. Mencken, published four years after the first quote I put up. And Mencken points out that the most dangerous person to a government is the person that thinks for themselves. The person that is able to critically think. Because when they are engaged in critical thought, they realize much of what government does, going back to Mencken of 1918, that first quote I put up, which is to create fear amongst us, is unnecessary. 
Now it is up to you and I as discerning citizens to think through what that might look like. But I hope, if anything, what you'll walk away from this evening thinking is no matter what my political or ideological <coughs> affiliation is, I need to exercise and flex my self-governing muscles to critically scrutinize everything that my government does, and I would submit, especially when it comes to matters of national security. Because if you look historically, matters of national security serve as a master key. They're a master key that unlocks the door to each and every one of our most precious and cherished liberties. And if you know your history, you know that the liberties that we are privileged enough to experience today are a very rare occurrence in human history. Uh, very rare. Uh, and, and once they're gone, they're hard to, to get back. Not impossible, but quite hard. Uh, and so to my way of thinking, uh, that requires a, a, a commitment to patriotism, a commitment to uh, country, skepticism of government, and a recognition that propaganda both exists, is omnipresent wherever governments are in existence and operation, and you and I have the power to both recognize that point, which is step one, but to push back if we so choose. Thank you all very much. I appreciate you attending, and uh, I think we have a few minutes for questions. Thank you.